Janice Ray. The sparrows are back and veeries deeper in the woods, thrushes singing their hearts out as I have been singing over and over the same beautiful line. New and tender leaves unfurl. I could almost think all is well. In the houses, the people are happy. But that spring, Hinesburg, Kansas was leveled or tornadoes spun an Alabama school. California burned hundreds of acres of Georgia. Spring's coolness, not quite cool enough. Honestly, I stand at my kitchen door and can't see spring for pavement. Electric wires running into sky, cars, lawn after lawn, trash, waiting in barrels to be collected. A cowbird worries the air. I tell you this, I want to love this world. I want to love it the way I used to love it, recklessly, boundlessly, the way I could love it, the way I love a, a bear blocking a wild trail, or a cottontail watching sunrise, golden light shining through her ears. I want to love transformers, street lights, hospital generator droning on and on. Oh, where is that infinite and forgiving love? 2007 was the summer a heat wave lingered over the South for 11 straight days, killing over 50 people and setting all kinds of weather records. Somewhere almost every day, an old record was trumped, hundreds of new highs. In August, Nashville registered 15 days above 100 degrees, the most recorded for any month. On August 22nd, the thermometer peaked at 102 blistering degrees, a new daily record. The hot south had never been hotter. Earlier that year, the heat had caused me to do something crazy. At the time, I was living in the north, in Brattleboro, Vermont, all during that fall, snow did not fall in southern Vermont, a place where snow, even if only a, a few flurries, flies by Halloween. We used to get snow and keep it until April, my letter carrier, Homer, told me. When I was a kid, we had a four-string barbed wire fence around the pasture at the farm, and in the middle of winter, I always skied over the top of it. That November, the Wall Street Journal published an editorial that poo-pooed climate disruption as human error. The earth is warmer now, quote, than it was in the recent past, it said, starting out promising, promisingly, but delivering then a poison arrow, and this may be partly attributable to human behavior. May be partly. Then the editors proceeded to point out the positive aspects, a longer growing season in Siberia or Canada, at least one possible benefit. It affirmed that more urgent, less speculative problems need solving, communicable diseases, sanitation, water, hunger, education. Quote, socialism was supposed to have died with the Soviet Union, but is making a comeback under the guise of, of coping with global warming. By December in Vermont, there was still no snow, not even a snow cloud, nor had the West River, which joins the Connecticut just north of Brattleboro, frozen over. Climate change was catching up with we Americans far more quickly than we thought. That December, New York City had no snow for the first time in 200 years. Duluth, Minnesota registered its first completely brown Christmas since 1875. And then when no blizzard had arrived in Vermont by January, and the weather news worldwide increasingly bad, with no action on the part of our government, we knew we had to act. On the morning of January 6th, with temperatures in the balmy 50s, wearing wetsuits, four of us activists set out on inner tubes from Dummerston, Vermont, on the West River, headed toward Brattleboro. We hung a banner from the Dummerston covered bridge that read, Where's Winter? and carried pictures of snowflakes on placards, along with signs that said, I'd rather be snowshoeing. 
although I would rather have been water skiing, actually. At the cover br covered bridge, we emerged dripping from 35 degree water to talk to reporters. There's usually one to two feet of ice on this river this time of year, said Jonathan Crowell. It's ludicrous we can tube it in January. We said that people are in denial. They won't about blame El Nino or anything. We said we're in a crisis. One, I believe in courage. I believe in the courage of human beings to take actions necessary to stabilize our climate and end this particular of violence against a glorious experiment called life. Two, to learn courage is possible. Rosa Parks proves that for 12 years before her famous law-defying act of refusing to move to the back of a bus, she was a member of the local NAACP. The summer before her civil disobedience, she attended a 10-day activist training workshop at the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. She heard Miles Horton, its founder, say, the way to use this information is not to say that we have learned a lot. And isn't it wonderful and great to have been at Highlander? You're here to act. This is education for action. Now, how are you going to act on this? Let's just plan what you are going to do when you go back. Three, I too would like to prove that courage is learnable. Martin Luther King Jr. said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Three, courage requires action. We are a nation of entrepreneurs, scholars, cooperators, inventors. We believe in progress. We know how to change. We have a long history, we do, of educating ourselves, of banding together to fight injustice, taxation without representation, slavery, the oppression of women, of children, we have often risen to the challenge of serving humanity rather than our own desires. Every right we have won as human beings, every inch we have moved toward peace and justice and equality, every move we've made to, made to protect those beings who have no voice has been accompanied by courage, by imagination, by struggle, by someone holding out a vision so that people could walk toward it. And that vision is the rebuilding of our lives so that they make sense and the restoration of our communities, both human and wild, and the stabilization of our atmosphere. What are you going to do?